All right, so here we go on a topic that's a special topic in the course, but is very important to understand uh, some things about gravity related to what we're going to do with black holes in just a little bit. So uh, if you weren't in class, or if you were in class and you want to get some heads up again, uh, this is about general relativity. There's a little cartoon at the top, and hopefully by the end, you'll understand the cartoon. Uh, or at least sometime whenever we get done with uh, our study on black holes. So just as a review, uh, we talked about neutron stars the last time. In the case of uh, supergiants, uh, supergiants can end their lives with a massive explosion called a uh, supernova, and the remnant that can be left behind is a neutron star. And neutron stars are mostly composed of neutrons, uh, all packed in nice and dense, but they can also have some uh, protons and neutrons as well. And they're the second most dense object in the universe because we're going to discover shortly what the most dense objects in the universe are. And they're typically about 20 kilometers in diameter. 20 kilometers is about 13 miles, but many are as small as like six miles in diameter. And uh, they have very strong magnetic fields typically, and many of them are also pulsars. And uh, we talked about pulsars in the last class. So the other way that type two supernovas can end up with remnants is as a black hole remnant. Now, neutron stars typically have masses between uh, 1.1 and 2.1 solar masses. And uh, black holes are remnants that have about three solar masses of mass or greater. And uh, it turns out that black holes are particularly special objects, and there's a reason why we call them black holes. And in order to understand how we can observe black holes, you need to understand this special topic in gravity called uh, general relativity. So the traditional view of gravity, which has uh, dominated in the world of astronomy and physics since the late 1600s, Isaac Newton wrote about gravity and uh, really made a connection between the idea of the force that causes free fall on Earth is the same force that allows objects to orbit, like the Earth orbiting the Sun. And for instance, in this diagram, Newtonian gravity describes gravity as a mutual attraction between any two masses that exist in the universe. So the Sun has a force on the Earth, and the Earth has a force on the Sun. Those forces are equal and opposite. And uh, as a result, the Earth ends up orbiting the Sun. The, Sun is not completely stationary. It does and can move because of its attraction to the many planets that orbit the sun. Uh, but because the sun has an extraordinary mass as compared to the mass of the earth, the motion of the sun is small and the motion of the earth is significantly greater. Uh, the force that allows the earth to orbit the sun is traditionally called the force of gravity. And you can describe that force using a pretty simple law, the law of universal gravitation. And uh, Isaac Newton published that work in the 1680s. And it turns out that Newtonian gravity does an excellent job of describing how gravitational attraction allows for centripetal motion in orbits and also describes, uh, you know, forces like uh, the force that exists to allow free fall to take place on Earth. But there are some limitations to Newtonian gravity. And... Uh, in the early 1900s, there was this gentleman who came along named Isaac, or uh, not Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein. And Albert Einstein was a pretty smart guy. In fact, whenever you ask a typical person to name a genius, they might first by might start off by naming Albert Einstein. Yeah, he's recognized as a genius, and many people know he was a physicist. But a lot of people can't tell you exactly what Isaac Newton did, or Albert Einstein did. Earlier on in this class, uh, we looked at some ideas of Einstein related to uh, converting matter into energy with that formula E equals mc squared. But Einstein had many other contributions in physics, and one of them is a topic called special relativity. Uh, but an important topic for us is an idea that he called general relativity. And general relativity is a more complete understanding of how objects are, uh, how the objects interact with each other, how matter interacts with other matter. And it's a more complete understanding of gravity. In other words, like how does matter 
interact with space and time. So there were some works that Einstein published beginning in 1911 up through and including 1916 related to this topic in general relativity. Um, and we now understand that general relativity is a much more complete understanding of gravity. There's a principle in uh, Einsteinian gravity or general relativity called the, the equivalence principle. So it turns out that all objects fall the same way under the influence of gravity on Earth. And uh, that force of attraction causing an acceleration can also describe how the Earth is in free fall around the sun in a, in a way that allows the centripetal acceleration to be the same as the gravitational acceleration. But more importantly, uh, Albert Einstein made this connection that an accelerating reference frame is equivalent to a gravitational field. And let me explain in detail what an accelerating reference frame is and how that relates to gravitational field. This is an image from the OpenStax astronomy book, and it d demonstrates the equivalence principle. So on the left-hand side, well, there are four people in elevators, and the person all the way to the left is just a person standing in an elevator, weighing themselves on a bathroom scale, like on a regular scale, on a balance. And let's say they weigh 150 pounds. Now, if you're just standing on an elevator that's not moving, you would weigh 150 pounds. And if the elevator was moving at a constant speed, either up or down, the elevator would also say you weigh 150 pounds. Now, the situation changes if the person is undergoing acceleration. If, when the person gets in the elevator, they're standing on the scale and they push the down button, and the elevator accelerates downward, going from a speed of zero to some other uh, speed with a velocity in the negative direction, uh, that increase in speed is accompanied by an acceleration. And that person's weight on that scale would say that they weigh a little bit less. So the 150 pound person may only experience 140 pounds of weight. That's 140 pounds of force uh, pushing up from the scale back on the person. On the other hand, if the person's on an elevator and they press the up button and accelerate from one floor to the next in the upward direction, the elevator would say that the person weighs more as they're accelerating upward. In the case of an elevator that's in free fall, and you don't have to worry because elevators don't go into free fall, there's lots of safety devices, but in case there was an elevator who was suspended by a cable and the cable snapped and the elevator went into free fall, uh, the person would seem to be weightless. The elevator would accelerate toward the center of the earth and so would the person, and there'd be no net force acting on the scale. They would seem to be weightless. In all these cases of acceleration, we call that an accelerating reference frame. So the person in the elevator doesn't have a sense as to whether the elevator is going up or down, except to look at what their apparent weight is on the scale. So if the scale is accel or if the person's accelerating upward, uh, they could conclude a couple different things: that the elevator is accelerating upward, or that there's some gravitational field acting on them in, you know, the upward vertical direction or something like that. Uh, there's a different concept between weight and mass. The person always has the same amount of mass. The mass of a person is how much matter they're composed of, but the weight of a person is uh, equal to their mass times the acceleration due to gravity. But their effective weight or their apparent weight depends both upon the uh, strength of the gravitational field and whatever accelerating reference frame they happen to be in. So here's the thing that Isaac or Albert Einstein said, is that gravitational fields and accelerating reference frames are equivalent to each other. Here's some things to think about. Uh, if you're on an elevator and that elevator is accelerating toward the earth in free fall, you would seem like you weigh nothing. And you would free fall with the same acceleration rate at the, as the elevator, and you could essentially be uh, floating relative to the elevator. It doesn't mean that you're not moving. It doesn't mean that you don't have a gravitational force acting on you. It's just that the net force that acts on you uh, as a result of your acceleration in the gravitational field would make you feel like you're weightless. 
The person on the right is aboard the International Space Station, and they would also say that they're weightless. And that doesn't mean that there's no gravity. There's a misconception that somehow if you're in outer space, there is no gravity. But it is gravity that allows the International Space Station to orbit around the Earth. The person would feel as if there's no gravitational field acting on them, or they're not in an accelerating reference frame. But in fact, they are in a gravitational field, and that gravitational field causes a acceleration due to gravity, which provides the centripetal acceleration for their motion around the center of the Earth. Uh, I put a link at the bottom of this slide where you can go and see what the current position of the International Space Station is and uh, track its motion. It takes the International Space Station about 90 minutes to orbit the Earth in, uh, in an orbit that's relatively close to the Earth itself. So I invite you to take a look at that. Another situation is what if you were in truly interstellar space at an enormous distance between stars so that the gravitational field acting on you from those stars would um, essentially be zero or be negligible. You would also say that you're weightless and you'd be just kind of floating around with no net acceleration. Well, the person on the right who's in interstellar space uh, experiencing no acceleration rate would uh, be equivalent to the person who's free falling toward the earth in that elevator. In both cases, the person would say that they're weightless. And that weightlessness comes about in a couple different ways. Now, the other situation is that if you were just standing on an elevator that's standing still, you feel a net acceleration toward the center of the earth. And that rate of acceleration is 9.8 uh, or 9.81 meters per second squared. And that net acceleration toward the center of the earth is what effectively ends up giving you weight. Now, that same person on board a rocket that is accelerating in interstellar space would also say that they have an acceleration rate of 9.81 meter per second squared. Now, in the situation on the top, when you're standing still on an elevator and weighing yourself on Earth, you're in a gravitational field. And that gravitational field has a field strength of 9.81 uh, meters per second squared, or 9.81 newtons per kilogram, but 9.81 meter per second squared. The person in the rocket that's accelerating in the upper right direction in this frame uh, would also say that they have an acceleration rate of 9.81 meter per second squared, if that's the acceleration rate of the rocket. And both of the people would say that they have the same amount of weight, in the sense that if you put a bathroom scale uh, between their feet, and the floor of the elevator or the floor of the rocket, they would both say that they weigh the same amount. Unless they knew that they were in a rocket or in an elevator that's stationary on a gravitational field, both of the people would say they weigh the same uh, regardless of the situation that they're in. So the person on the top is stationary in a gravitational field from the Earth, and they have an acceleration rate of 9.81 meter per second squared, the person on the right is in no real gravitational field, but is in a rocket that's accelerating at 9.81 meter per second squared. And it's Albert Einstein who said that in both situations, uh, the acceleration is indistinguishable whether you're in a gravitational field or whether your velocity is changing as a result of some kind of a force that causes an acceleration. And that is the uh, equivalence principle. Another way to look at this is, so if you were to have two people and here they're standing at the top of uh, kind of like an infinitely deep chasm, and let's say there was no gravity at all, and they were gonna toss a basketball back and forth, the basketball could go straight back and forth between the people with no trouble at all. If both of the people simultaneously jump into this very deep chasm and still play catch, throwing the ball back and forth, the ball could still travel straight back and forth between the people. And yet, as they're in free fall toward the center of the earth in this very, very deep chasm, let's say it's, you know, incredibly deep and there's some safe way for them to land, to each of them, each of their reference frames, the ball is just going to travel straight back and forth between the people. That's what the horizontal blue arrow represents in the, in the game of catch. But to us as an outside observer, what we would see is not the ball going straight back and forth between the people, but it would travel as a projectile traveling 
uh, from one person to the next in that kind of parabolic drop. So which of the things is true or which of them is real? Is the ball going straight back and forth between the people or is the ball traveling in this parabolic path as the people accelerate? And it depends upon your frame of reference, it depends upon your point of view. So what we have to consider is that although you might feel like you're not moving on the earth, uh, we are in motion. We're moving around the sun. Uh, the sun is in motion relative to the center of our galaxy. Our galaxy is in motion relative to other galaxies. Uh, but from our point of view on the earth, we seem as if we are the center of the universe and everything is equidistant from us. And we'll learn further on in the class, not everything's equidistant. The edge of the universe is equidistant in all directions. And, uh, uh, also, it seems like distant galaxies are moving away from us, regardless of the direction we look at. Di galaxies that are approximately the same distance from us seem to be moving away at about the same acceleration rate. So we have this whole issue of how things seem to be relative to the viewpoint of the observer. Uh, it's an issue with how we understand the world by looking through telescopes. But um, if you're not able to keep up with all these different ideas because you haven't studied physics very much or whatever. What's most important about understanding general relativity is the consequences of general relativity and how it allows us to observe objects that happen to be in space. So another way to kind of look at this equivalence principle is as the Inter International Space Station orbits the Earth, is it in a gravitational field? Is it accelerating? Well, the International Space Station travels at a relatively constant speed as it orbits the Earth. And it's in a gravitational field, and it is accelerating. So how can something be moving at a constant speed and accelerating? Well, accelerations are occur whenever there's a change in velocity as a function of time, and velocities are vectors. So if you're moving at a constant speed, but your direction constantly changes, then you are undergoing acceleration. And that acceleration is not described as a change in speed for the International Space Station, but as a constant change in direction. And that constant change in direction is uh, an acceleration that happens to exist because there's a gravitational field exerted by the Earth. So what is the true meaning of the force due to gravity? Is it really a force or is it really something else? And uh, Einstein says that well, these gravitational fields, which extend from masses, especially from very large masses, can have very large gravitational fields, are equivalent to accelerating reference frames. So here's another idea. It turns out that in very short distances, uh, we say that light travels in a straight line. And if you shine a flashlight straight across a laboratory, um, it travels in a nice straight line in the laboratory itself without any reasonable or measurable change in uh, direction for the light. Here's a th famous thought experiment that Einstein had. So what if you were to have an elevator that's accelerating upward? Would light behave the same way as a basketball would? Whereas if you throw a basketball, that basketball the basketball's motion to an outside observer, if the person's in an accelerating reference frame, would appear as if it moves like in a parabolic motion or in some kind of a curved motion. Would light behave the same as matter? So if you were to have an accelerating uh, elevator moving upward, the light that leaves the flashlight traveling to the right in the left image, uh, would it hit directly across from where the light is emitted from the flashlight, or as the elevator accelerates upward, would that light hit someplace below? So how does that relate to being in a gravitational field? If it's true that uh, not only matter, but also light is accelerated, or it uh, changes direction as a result of being an accelerating reference frame, and if accelerating reference frames are equivalent to gravitational fields, then it should be that if you're stationary on Earth and you shine a light horizontally, that those photons that leave the flashlight should also drop toward the center of the Earth in the sense that 
the path that the light takes isn't exactly a straight line anymore, but its motion is changed by the gravitational field of the Earth. So in reality, the uh, speed at which the light travels is extraordinarily fast, uh, three times 10 to the eighth meter per second. And in an, in, in an experiment, in a room, the time it would take for the light to get across the room is very small. So the amount of deflection of the light would be, uh, well, not zero, but incredibly small, infinitesimally small. So how do you scale this kind of experiment up? And how would the experiment look if you did scale it up? Uh, in the OpenStax books, uh, in OpenStax book, there's a diagram like this. So as the space shuttle, uh, which we don't use anymore, has been to orbit for a while, but the space shuttle or International Space Station, if you had a beam of light traveling from the back of the cargo bay in the space shuttle to the front of the cargo bay in the space shuttle, would it hit the, the front of the cargo bay from like position A to B? Uh, or as the international or as the uh, space shuttle is orbiting the Earth and its position constantly changes as a result of being in a gravitational field, does the light also change direction as a result of being in the gravitational field? That's an experiment that you could do aboard a spacecraft. And it turns out uh, that kind of experiment is done regularly. And there's actually pairs of satellites that are in orbit uh, that are used to measure Earth's gravitational field, variances in Earth's gravitational field, especially a mission called the GRACE mission, in which we uh, shine a light or laser from one spacecraft to another that are separated by some kind of distance, but they're both traveling along in the Earth's gravitational field. And it turns out that light does get deflected in the same way as the matter for the spacecraft gets deflected. So Einstein suggests that the light curves down to meet the front of the shuttle because Earth's gravity uh, bends the fabric of space and time. So what does it mean to bend the fabric of space and time? Uh, here's a, I took a course one time on uh, cosmology and the person who was lecturing did an extraordinary job at describing what it means to uh, bend space and time. And this was the analogy that that person gave. So this might be a little bit of a stretch, but if you can follow along, it's actually an extraordinary analogy. Uh, we live in a three-dimensional world. You can describe any position in the world that you live in as being in some uh, three-dimensional space. Like it's forward and backward, left and right, and up and down. And any position in space in our uh, classical way can be described by uh, talking about positions in three dimensions. So let's imagine that you lived in a one-dimensional world. A one-dimensional world would only have one dimension of motion, just forward and backward along a line. And if you're a one-dimensional being, uh, you could be a point in space or you could be a line, but you could have no height and you could have no width. And the only thing that you would know in terms of the space that you could occupy is a position along that line. And in fact, when you learned about mathematics, the first thing that you learned in number theory really was about the number line. And the number line is a good re representation of uh, like a one dimensional view of the mathematical world. So if you had a one dimensional being living in a one dimensional world where it had no sense of up and down or left and right, but only forward and backward, that red dot could uh, be that being that describes its position as some place along that line. Now, what if you could bend that line? Let's say we put some mass on that line, maybe like it's a string or a, a bungee cord. And if you press down on that string, that one dimensional being would still only talk about its position on that, uh, on that string or on that line, but would have no sense that that string had been stretched into a second dimension. Uh, the person's view of reality would still measure its position along that line, but be unaware of a second dimension. The next step would be think of a, a two-dimensional being. 
So if you had a two-dimensional being, and that would be represented by a plane shape, like that blue uh, rectangle that's on a two-dimensional plane, if you had a two-dimensional being living on a two-dimensional plane, it could describe its size as having a width and a length, but height would not have any kind of meaning. Height would be something that wouldn't be observable and uh, wouldn't have a meaning in that two-dimensional being's world. So what if you were to put some kind of a force on that two-dimensional worldview to stretch the fabric of that two-dimensional space and time? So in this little analogy, what if that two-dimensional space and time happened to be able to be warped by some kind of mass? And in this case, there's a little globe of the Earth where the presence of the Earth in that two-dimensional space would stretch the fabric of space-time from two, being two-dimensional to three-dimensional. So that, that two-dimensional being would be unaware that there's a third dimension, a stretch to that fabric in, of space and time. But if that two-dimensional being were to travel along that two-dimensional uh, space, they would actually move into a third dimension. And the distances that they would travel across that position would be different. So that's the way Einstein wants us to think about the world. We are three-dimensional beings living in a three-dimensional world. We experience three dimensions, the X, the Y, and the Z axis, or forward and backward, left and right, and up and down. But the presence of mass in our universe stretches the fabric of space and space into a fourth dimension. And that fourth dimension is now uh, an effect that Einstein makes us think about this concept of space-time. And space-time, all one word, describes how the three dimensions of space get warped into a fourth dimension, really that of time, by the presence of mass, or by the presence of matter. So this might sound like some kind of science fiction sort of thing, but I'll tell you, this is settled science. We're uh, well over 100 years into truly understanding that Einstein's view of gravity and the very nature of space and time isn't the way that Isaac Newton described in the 1600s, but is a little more complex. But in some ways it's more simple because we can understand uh, why and how things move the way that they do. We can completely describe how orbital motion takes place and we can explain phenomena that could not be explained using Newton's gravity. So altogether, we live in a three-dimensional world and in interstellar space, in the absence of gravitational fields, if you could have zero gravitational field in some space, the three dimensions are just the classical forward, backward, left and right, and up and down. But anytime you add matter to the three dimensions of our universe, you stretch the fabric of space and time into three dimensions of space and a new dimension of time. Uh, Isaac Newton always described space and time to be separate concepts, but Einstein says, no, space and time are really all one thing. And one of the marks of genius in physics, in a way, is to be able to connect things that were seemingly unconnected, much like how Einstein said that it isn't that there's matter and there's energy, but there's an equivalence between matter and energy. You can convert matter into energy, and the equation E equals mc squared tells us that if you take any amount of mass in kilograms and multiply it by the speed of light squared, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th meter per second, uh, that quantity squared gets you an equivalent amount of energy in the unit, the joule. Okay, so the general theory of relativity is that the presence of matter curves or warps this fabric of space-time. And the curving of space-time is equivalent to our description of what gravity really is. And how much that space-time gets distorted depends both upon the amount of mass that's present, but also in a way the amount of density. In other words, how much matter do you pack into a certain amount of space? So the amount of stretch of space-time is greater, you could say, for the sun than for the earth, because the sun has a significantly greater mass than the Earth. But what if you could take the mass of the Sun and pack it down into a much smaller space so that the density of that matter is significantly greater? 
Well, that changes things a little bit because now the amount of curvature of space-time increases in the sense of how much space you travel through. And we're getting to this idea of how essentially black holes can even be observed because in black holes, the amount of stretch of space-time is extraordinary. And we don't observe the black hole and we don't observe any light that's emitted from the black hole in the classical way, although light can be emitted from black hole. Now, there's a famous saying uh, by John Wheeler, matter tells space-time how to curve and space-time tells matter how to move. And we'll get into what that means. So here's a better way to think about how orbits really take place. In this illustration, although it shows that a two-dimensional kind of like fabric being stretched into a third dimension, we live in a three-dimensional world that's stretched into a fourth dimension. But if there was a regular planar grid representing space-time, and then you put a bunch of mass in it, you would stretch that two-dimensional space into a third dimension. We live in a three-dimensional universe, and the addition of mass stretches space-time into a fourth dimension. But in this visual analogy, uh, you have like a sheet, a uh, rubber sheet, or maybe like a fabric sheet. And the presence of a bunch of mass, that's that big sphere in the center, stretches the sheet in such a way that you could imagine that if you were to have a ball that were able to travel with no air resistance or friction, it could roll around in that cone. And the rate at which it rolls around in that cone depends upon how much the space-time gets stretched by the mass in the center. And uh, it depends upon the position. So it turns out that if you're quite a ways away from that thing that's in the center, the rate at which you'd go around the circle would be slower. And if you're further down into that dent that's made, the faster you'd have to go to stay in a stable orbit. In a way, uh, Albert Einstein says that it isn't a mutual attraction between the Earth and the Sun that allows the Earth to orbit the Sun, but that the Sun puts a big dent in space-time. The Earth also puts a dent in space-time. But the Earth's motion around the Sun comes about as a result of the Sun's large dent in space-time that's made in our local part of the universe. It seems like some kind of science fiction or hokum or not what we think to be true, but that's the most sophisticated way to actually think about gravity. And in a way, it's, it's quite simple. It's a very elegant way to understand the universe. So in the OpenStax book, there's a description here about a couple different situations you could have. Uh, although an ant is a three-dimensional being and it can understand up and down, if you were to stretch a rubber sheet so that the ant travels across that rubber sheet, and if there were nothing on the sheet, the ant would travel in a perfectly straight line. If you were to distort the sheet by putting some kind of mass on the sheet and the ant were to travel across that sheet, um, even if it were just a grain of sand, the grain of sand would stretch the, the sheet down in such a way that the ant would no longer take a perfectly straight path. If you were to put a heavy weight on the sheet, the amount of stretch would be greater. And in a way, whenever you put matter in the presence of space, in our three-dimensional space, you stretch the fabric of our three-dimensional world into a fourth dimension, just the same way as putting a mass on a two-dimensional sheet stretches that rubber sheet into a third dimension. So here's some things that are true. Uh, not only will matter follow those paths around uh, dense in space-time, but Einstein also says that light ought to do it too. That light will always travel in the shortest path through space-time. That large concentrated sources of matter put a larger distortion in space and time. That should say space-time, it's misspelled. And the shortest and most direct paths aren't necessarily straight lines, but are curves. Just the same as if you distort the sheet that the ant walks across by placing any mass on the sheet, there are no longer any straight paths that the ant can take uh, in, in a three-dimensional three sense, that the ant has to take a path that is curved because the sheet will have to be curved. So here's some tests of general relativity, because you might say, well, how do we even know if this is even true? Einstein was a great theoretical physicist, uh, and, much, and all, much or all of his work didn't come from observations and experiments, but from 
mathematical proofs from theory. So here's some tests of general relativity. Earlier on in the course, we talked about the idea that planets don't orbit the sun in circular orbits, but they orbit in elliptical orbits. And those uh, orbits vary in their eccentricity. Mercury has a fairly eccentric orbit or highly elliptical orbit. And whenever Mercury is closest to the sun, it's about uh, 0.31 AU from the sun at its perihelion. And whenever the Mercury is furthest from the sun, it's about 0.46 AU. But it turns out that when Mercury orbits the sun, the orientation of the major axis of the orbit isn't always exactly in the same direction, but there's a precession to its orbit. And it turns out that there's a predicted amount by which uh, the orbit of Mercury around the Sun uh, should change or should advance. So what this illustration shows is where it says uh, perihelion 1, the very first arrow coming in from the lower right-hand corner of the screen, would represent the uh, motion of Mercury going around the Sun uh, in one orbit, and then in the next orbit, and the next orbit, and then finally one orbit after that. Now, this diagram is exaggerated quite a bit. But according to uh, Newton's theory of gravity, the amount by which the perihelion uh, advances is 531 arc seconds per century. Okay, so what's an arc second? Well, there are 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in a degree. So there are 3600 arc seconds in a degree. Well, 531 arc seconds is only about, let's see, about one seventh of a degree. So the amount by which Mercury's perihelion advances is only about one seventh of a degree per century. In this illustration, it's much greater than that, but it's just exaggerated for illustration so you can see what the idea is. When we observe the motion of Mercury around the sun, and this is even before Einstein's general relativity was developed, it was known that the amount that it uh, advances isn't 531 arc seconds per century, but about 574 arc seconds per century. Uh, and it turns out that that change in advance or the difference in advance from predicted to observe wasn't explained, but under Einstein's general relativity, it turns out that it works out just right. So it's not like it's a problem looking for a solution. Uh, or a solution looking for a problem. I don't know, whichever way you want to say it. Uh, but it turns out that one of the mysteries of the precession advance for Mercury uh, wasn't able to be explained fully using Newton's gravity. More importantly, and this is actually an experiment that Einstein said that should be done in order to see the effect of general relativity, is um, this phenomena that we call gravitational lensing. And on the very first night of the course, we looked at some pictures of from the James Webb Space Telescope, or may have been the second night. And I asked you to look for things. It looked unusual in an image of a portion of the sky. And one of the things that you notice is a bunch of different blurry mm -hmm. curved lines. And I'll show you an image of this toward the end of the lecture right here. But nonetheless, on the left-hand side, there's an image of a page from one of Einstein's notebooks. And it turns out that in that image, there is a image or a picture of the, or a sketch of the sun. And the sun is that circle with a dot in the middle. And then the thing to the left is the earth. And then there's like some little diagram that's shown there. And it turns out that the OpenStax textbook does, you know, just a perfect kind of recreation of it in exactly the same way, showing the way in which uh, light would be um, affected by the gravitational field of the sun as light travels around or past the sun. So in this illustration, if you had a distant star where light's coming from that star, as that light travels from that distant star past the earth or past the sun, the sun's gravitational field could change the direction of that light so that the path that the light travels toward the earth is not the same as the uh, direction the light was traveling from. Now, how it works is whenever you're observing something, uh, looking at it through a telescope or looking at it 
with your eye, whichever direction the light comes into your eye is the direction that you say that the object is actually in. So in other words, if you had light that was traveling from past the sun toward our eye, uh, as it comes in toward our eye, we would say that the position of the object would be straight in line with that light that's, that's coming toward us. And the apparent position of the star would be out here somewhere, when in reality, the star is at some other position. So here's the deal. Uh, Einstein's, I guess you could say, prediction of this says, well, all you got to do is look toward the sun and look at a distant star whose light is traveling just past the edge of the sun. And there's a big problem with that. And that's that from the earth, uh, you have to look through the atmosphere and the atmosphere itself glows a pretty bright blue. And besides that, you're trying to observe a star that's significantly dimmer than the sun. So when you look in the appro appropriate direction, basically in the direction of the sun, it's going to be during daytime and you're trying to look at a star that's right beside the sun and that's really not observable. Now, from space, it can be observable, but in the early 1900s, of course, we'd never been to space. So there's no space-based telescopes. So from the Earth, you have to say, well, how is it going to be possible that we could do an experiment where we look at a star by looking in the direction of the sun and being able to see that star? It doesn't seem like it would even be possible at all. Uh, and Einstein predicted that this uh, change in direction from the sun, from, from that star, would be observable in some kind of way. So here's the genius. All you got to do is block out the sun somehow. And you just got to put something in front of the sun to get rid of the sunlight. Well, there's a natural phenomena when that happens. And it turns out that the angular size of the moon is just about the same as the angular size of the sun. Uh, and during a solar eclipse, like a total solar eclipse, the moon casts a shadow on the earth in a small area or a small band uh, as the moon passes between the earth and the sun. That, uh, that band of the shadow of the moon that's cast on the earth allows you to essentially look in the direction of the sun and be able to see stars that are just toward the edge of the sun themselves. So in 1914, there was a total solar eclipse and uh, one of the best observing locations happened to be in Crimea. And uh, so an expedition was launched to observe that eclipse and there were some U.S., German, and English scientists. And it turns out that, unfortunately, just three weeks before the eclipse took place, uh, at the, you know, in the beginning of Germany's involvement in World War I, Germany had declared war on Russia. And as a result, uh, there were some of the German scientists were expelled from Crimea, uh, or they were taken prisoner of war. And it turns out the remaining U.S. and English scientists unfortunately had a cloud, cloudy night or cloudy day during the eclipse. And unfortunately, uh, to astronomers, there's nothing you can do about clouds. You can have all the greatest equipment, be all set up to make an observation of the sky and clouds come overhead and that's it. And it turns out that the proof for Einstein's general relativity with this idea of gravitational lensing wasn't able to be observed in that eclipse in 1914. Then there was another expedition launched five years later in 1919. Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington had a, a expedition in 1919. There was actually two locations where the Earth's or where the solar eclipse shadow would cross the Earth. Uh, first, or in one place in uh, Brazil, and the other place just off the west coast of Africa on a small island. And so they decided. Uh, well, if it's going to be cloudy in one place, we've got kind of a backup, I guess you could say. And so the two locations were chosen, uh, funding was secured, and the picture on the left is actually a picture from uh, one of the observational uh, setups to be able to take pictures both uh, before and during the eclipse of the positions of stars that are nearby the sun. And it turns out that there were photographic plates made in both locations but the uh, location off the coast of Africa turns out to be, you know, kind of better data. And actually for a while, and it's been uh, repeatedly, I guess, re-examined, uh, there was periods of time where they weren't quite sure if there was a statistically 
or a measurable change in the position. And there was some uh, scientists who were like, yeah, the data actually doesn't really support Einstein, but in the end, it looks like it sort of does. Anyway, nonetheless, uh, this is what like a negative and a positive plate from the expedition looks like. And this is a page that's from uh, the Times London talking about uh, what was supposed to be observed for the position of stars in the sky as a result of the presence of the sun whose uh, disk is blocked out by uh, the uh, solar eclipse on, uh, on that day. And it turns out that, so this image is not to scale, but it's an illustration of what, how the, the process works. So from Earth, you have some kind of viewing location. And from that viewing location on Earth, you look at the position of a uh, star in the sky. This is obviously not to scale. And the reference images were taken about six months before the eclipse. Uh, but nonetheless, you've got some kind of star at a distance. That light comes in to the Earth. And you observe the position of that star based upon the background of stars or in a particular direction based upon some kind of reference. And then during the eclipse, so here's the sun and there's the moon. Uh, the sun shines in all directions, but the sunshine or the sunlight that shines toward the moon uh, illuminates the backside of the moon. And there's this shadow that's cast on the earth. And from that same viewing location, it turns out that the star that you would see in this direction isn't viewable in that location, but it's viewable as being in another location. So let me uh, explain this illustration. The light from that sun or from that star, as it travels toward the sun in a relatively straight line, travels into the gravitational field of the sun. Sun has dented space time here in a way so that, that light no longer travels in a straight line, but the direction of the light follows a different path, like a curved path. And then here toward the earth, it's more of a straight line. And just like the illustration that uh, Einstein proposed, whenever we are here on the Earth then, looking at the light that comes to the Earth from that distant star, we would say we observe the star to be not in the direction that the star actually is, but in the direction where the light comes to our eye from, which is kind of like along the straight line and then along the dotted line. So now instead of the star appearing on that reference line, that blue reference line, the star appears to be in another location kind of offset in a way. And it turns out as a result of Eddington's uh, expedition. And since then, you know, thousands upon thousands of observations of the same effect, sometimes during solar eclipses and other times in observations of black holes and other things, we see that the light uh, has its direction changed as a result of the gravitational field from uh, the sun or from other stars or in a sense, from black holes, because where we're going with this is this could be a, not an illuminated, illuminating object or a luminous object, but it could be a black hole. And the presence of that black hole, because it has mass and it, it dense space and time, could change the direction of light as it travels past the black hole. So this is the illustration that's shown from uh, the OpenStax thing, where you've got an earthbound observer, they're observing light from some location, and the apparent position of that star is not the same as the actual position of star because the light from that star has been uh, bent by the gravitational field of the sun, or we say gravitationally lensed by the sun. So for instance, if you were to look past a galaxy, galaxies have on the order of billions of stars, at a galaxy that's in the background, in a way, just like a magnifying glass, a uh, convex lens can change the direction that light travels. Uh, you can have a distant galaxy that's behind a closer galaxy, but the light from the distant galaxy as it travels kind of up in this direction, it gets gravitationally lensed or bent by a nearby galaxy and travels toward our eye. And that light, whenever we observe it coming in from this side, from the top part, we say, oh, that light came in from the top part of the galaxy. And then similarly, some light from that distant galaxy can travel down around the bottom, get gravitationally lensed, and then up toward our eye. And as a result, instead of seeing the galaxy that's behind the nearby one, which would be blocked by the nearby one, 
we may see it as a figment of actually two separate galaxies, one above and one below. So this is an image taken of a galaxy, and these other four things are actually one thing that's behind the other one. So back to that James Webb Space Telescope image from uh, the first or second night of class. There are some things that you notice about the image uh, that we talked about. There are some individual stars in the image, and those are the bright, pointy looking things, and we'll get we'll go over why they have the star points on them whenever we get to that little unit in the class. But this is a star, that's a star, this is a star, and there's another star. And then many of the other objects in the image are entire whole galaxies. And some of the galaxies appear to be red in color and some appear to be blue in color. And uh, some of them we're looking at edgewise and some of them we're looking at, um, you know, perpendicular to the galactic plane. But then in the center of the image, you see these like smudges or swirls. And those smudges, which kind of run around the image, uh, kind of making these like shapes around the center, those are figments of gravitational lensing. They're examples of light that's coming from a distant place in the galaxy, getting bent in a way by a foreground or a nearby object. And you see a number of those examples of the effect of gravitational lensing just in this one image. And we see it all the time in astronomical images whenever we take pictures uh, of objects in deep space. So the most important thing to understand about general relativity is that it's a new view of the way that gravity works, that uh, the presence of a star or uh, a black hole or a galaxy or any other thing that's in the universe has a gravitational field extending from it. And those gravitational fields are equivalent to accelerating reference frames. And those accelerating reference frames uh, or those gravitational fields, that bending of space-time, can not only change the direction and the motion of matter to allow for orbits to take place, but it can also change the direction that light travels. So not only does the change in direction for the light prove general relativity, but it allows us to have a tool to observe things that have mass, like black holes, but that don't uh, that aren't luminous themselves, that don't give off light. So I hope it was interesting to learn a little bit about general relativity. I invite you to read some more about general relativity. But the most important thing to know is how general relativity changes the fabric of space-time and that light, in a way, can be bent by gravitational fields or have its direction changed by gravitational fields.